afraid. Insecure. I'm too big. I'm not enough. I'm too black. I'm too loud. I'm too proud. I'm too me. Now, these are things that I've said about myself over the course of my life. And I'd be lying to you if I said they didn't seep back in every now and again. But I'm very conscious about the words that I say about myself and the things that I think about myself. So all this got me to thinking. The very first time our feelings got hurt, it was because someone said something to us. But it was OK, because someone was like, sticks and stones may break your bones, but words will never hurt you. To be honest, I'll take the sticks and stones. Those wounds heal a lot easier. Word wounds, on the other hand, can take a lifetime to heal. And I'd venture to say that most of us in this room have lived our lives trying to heal from things that people have said to us. I also figured out something else. We do one of two things in life. We either spend our lives confirming what people have said about us or defying them. Take me, for example. I have spent my whole life defying what people have said about me. I refuse to be a statistic. When I think about myself, I say, who am I? I'm a product of a single parent home. By the way, my mother's a superhero. But there are things that come along with that. Mid to low income, family, grew up in the projects for a portion of my life. There are some statistics that come along with being a young black woman from that type of background. So I've decided that that was not going to be my story. Then I had some other thoughts as well, because I didn't have to define, well, then who am I for myself? I've always been taught that the power of life and death comes from right here. The simple thing to create and destroy comes out of your mouth. So what am I creating? What am I destroying? What am I doing to create new things in myself? Or what am I destroying by the words that I'm saying? I think about that a lot because I work with students, wonderful humans, they are. But they come to me with lots of things about how they feel about themselves based on what other people have said about them. So I always talk to them about, no, let's think this way. So I pour a lot into them. I tell them they can be great. I tell them they can change the world because they can. They're the way that I change the world. I think about a student who I had once. I worked at a previous institution, and the makeup of the institution was more STEM-related. 70% of the population was male, 30% of the population female. That means something for those young women at that institution, because people think things about them based on the fact that they are women in this place. It sends them messages about what you're capable of and what you're not. So she comes into my office, and you can tell she's not having a good day. And I was like, what's going on? Well, to give you a little background, she had decided that she didn't want to be an engineer. Now, this was a big deal at this particular institution. She's like, no, I'm going to be a business major. I'm going to be the person who sells the things that engineers do. That's going to be me. And I was like, great. Do you. Have fun. <laughs> but that day, she had an incident with a student in her class, a male student who had questioned her about her major and then her abilities. They were like, oh, so you took the easy way out. Really hurt her something terrible. So she continues to talk, and I finally say, the next time someone says that to you, you look them dead in the face and you say, that's why you're gonna work for me one day. <laughs> she goes, LaFerrin, I can't say that. I said, yes, you can. If someone has the audacity to tell you who you will be, you have the right to tell them what they'll do for you one day. <laughs> she goes. She halfway believes me. But I was like, it's OK. And we went on in conversation. She comes back a few weeks later, because we've had lots of conversations about her being very confident in who she was and the choices that she was making. She comes back a few weeks later, high energy, very unusual for her to give you a picture of her. She's about 5'2", young Indian woman, more reserved, more reserved than me, anyway. <laughs> and she goes, oh my goodness. I was like, 
was, oh my goodness, are you okay? She said, <laughs> so I was in my class, hand on hip, all these things. I was in my class, and again, this boy said something else about me being a major, and this, this, and she kept going on and on. And she said, you know what I did? Finally, I stopped and said, that's why you're going to work for me one day. <laughs> I said, did you say it just like that? She said, well, yeah. I said, <laughs> like, just like that? And she goes, yes, that's what you told me to say. And, th and she continues to go on. In that moment, I had to chuckle because it was like watching myself talk to myself. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, this could be interesting. But it was all right. But in that moment, I saw my student find her voice. For her to stand very confident in who she had decided to be and was okay with expressing that with the world. And that, for me, was beautiful. So I think about a lot of those things, and I think about the role models I've had in my life that have helped me to do other things. And as a young black woman, sometimes you don't see a lot of people who look like you in the spaces that you're in. So I take that to heart, and I tend to mentor young black women. It's a passion. Um, someone helped me, and I stand on those shoulders of giants, and so I always pay that forward. So I think about that in some of my other interactions with students. Some students come to me, one in particular, she was thinking about studying abroad. She'd never been out of the country. She'd never been out of the state of Florida. Young black woman. I was like, you should do it. It's great. It changes your perspective. You meet new people. You could possibly think about learning another language. She was like, yeah, but no. And so I shared my experience with her. And she was like, hmm, okay. Goes on by her business. I tend to get a lot of students who come back to me to tell me about their life experiences and things that have happened to them, and I love it. She, of course, happens to be one of them. She comes back to me, and she goes, I get it now. I said, you get what? We just started this conversation. She was like, remember when you used to say, like, be great, go change the world, all of these things? I was like, yeah be great, go change the world. What, I'm confused. She was like, well, now I get it. Like, I understand what you mean. And I was like, what exactly does that mean? And she goes, well, I figured out that it's okay to be afraid and to still try stuff. Like, you can't stop me. And I was like, okay. What else did we learn? She was like, and like, I met all these amazing people, and it was great, and I went here, and I went here, and I did this, and could you imagine that I jumped off of, I said, I don't want to know what you jumped off of. It's really okay. And I was like, when did we come to this new realization? And she goes, oh, when I was on a train to Prague, I said, okay. She had taken the chance to study abroad, something she never thought that she would do. And I was like, that is awesome, and that's amazing. She was like, well, I know that I can do it, and I can just be whatever I want to be, and that's awesome. And I was like, right, I've been trying to tell you this for the last three years. This is beautiful. Uh, but for me, having her see someone like herself who had taken a chance and done something different and been okay with saying, I'm afraid, but it's going to be okay. I actually might learn something about myself. I may become a different person after this experience was beautiful for me. What I learned in that is that when I became comfortable in who I was and who I am and who I choose for the world to see, it gave other people permission to do the same. But life isn't that easy, right? We make different life choices, and in the midst of the choices that we make, sometimes life happens to us that makes us rethink who we are. For me, that experience was my hair. Yes, I know, it's fabulous. <laughs> but seven years ago, I made a decision to cut all of my hair off. In the black community, that's something real major, to cut off all your hair. Just want to let you know. <laughs> and so it came from a conversation with my goddaughter's mother about my goddaughter, who was having conversations about who she was. She had told her, I'm not black. And I said, she told you what? <laughs> She's not black. What is happening? 
part of it is because she watches Disney and she sees her Disney princesses and she sees herself the way what she sees on television. So she didn't see a little black princess or a little black fairy princess, so she didn't believe it. I said, okay, so we need to have a talk. But how do you convey to a four-year-old how to appreciate her blackness? And so her mother and I had a conversation because that began with a conversation with myself in the mirror. When did I become comfortable with my blackness, who I was, and who I am? What is part of that identity? For me, my hair was a part of it, and I chopped it off. Now, with that chopping off my hair came lots of things, lots of comments, lots of people, well, why would you do that? Because it's my hair. Um, but even from people who I loved, who weren't really sure about this, it was because they were trained to think certain things as well. I never really thought that at that experience would be valuable to someone else until a student walked into my office getting ready for an interview. She comes in, she was like, and this was the interview she had been waiting for. And I was like, this is great. We got the interview, let's go. She was like, I'm ready. I know what I'm wearing, which is actually the most important thing. And I'm ready, I've done the mock interview, I'm ready to go. And I was like, awesome, great. She was like, I have one thing. And I was like, what's your one thing? She's like, what am I gonna do with my hair? Now, why is this important? This is a young black woman who also has natural hair. Big, beautiful fro, but she was also in a point in her life where she was trying to figure out what all this meant. Who was she in the body that she was in? And I said, what do you mean what you're gonna do with your hair? You put some moisturizer in it, you're gonna keep it moving. She goes, it's not that simple. And I was like, and why isn't it? She was like, because having my hair like this, this is not professional. You can't do this in a professional setting. I said, really? I said, well, am I professional? Is my hair appropriate for this professional setting? And she goes, uh. So I ask again, is my hair professional? Is it okay in this professional setting? She goes, well, I, I said, how about you think about this? Do you want to work for a place that will not accept you in the package that you're coming in? She goes, I didn't really think about that. I said, hmm, that might be something we want to talk about. And I share those things with you because, again, I had to recalculate again my I am's. But I figured out that, again, once I got comfortable, somebody else was able to shine too. And so I think about that as I move through my life. And I always am asking myself, well, who am I? So I say to you, who am I? Well, I'm the person who loves onion rings, but I don't like onions. <laughs> I eat fried green tomatoes, but I faithfully take them off of my sandwich instead of just asking for them not to be there. <laughs> I'm quirky, I'm sassy, I'm a nerd. What I also found out is that my IMs have helped me impact my students in a way. And my challenge to you is to figure out, once you stand in the truth of who you are and figure out your IMs, who can you impact? So that you can say things like, I'm great, I'm fabulous, I'm fierce, and above all, <laughs> I'm brilliant. <laughs> I mean. But, but one thing that I am is grateful to have shared this space and energy with you.